question, am I of value? wonder if you've ever asked that before. Am I of value? What makes you worth it? Is your value determined by your abilities and skills? So when I uh, played basketball this week with Caleb and Luke, are they, are they more valuable because they had wicked basketball skills than the rest of us? Or is your value determined by what others think or say about you? So many of us, that's how we see our worth, by how other people perceive us and what other people say about us. Or is your value determined by your mental capacity or contributions to society, what you can do for other people. What gives you value? This is a question for the ages. There's been many different theories. Existentialism says you are what you do. So you make your value by what you do in life. But this would mean that some are more valuable than others. Is the doctor more valuable than the checkout chum or checkout chick? Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. That famous slogan, I think, therefore I am. Are you valuable because you think? Because you have cognitive awareness? Does rational thought determine our value? If so, humans are less va some humans are less valuable than others. Some humans are less meaningful than others. The mentally handicapped, the baby in the womb, do they have less value? Are you of less value than the person sitting somewhere else in this room, than the person sitting next to you? People debate this all the time. I think in general, right? our society in Bannockburn, I see in general, we believe that humans have inherent and equal value, don't we? In general, that's what we believe, a value that isn't determined by our ability or achievements, but a value that's determined by simply being human. And see, that belief is the belief that abolished slavery. That's the belief that gives every human equal value. We believe that a helpless baby in our arms who contributes nothing to society is just as valuable as the adult who thinks and works and contributes, don't we? The problem is, the only way that we can truly believe this is if there's a God. Without God then this simply isn't true. It's only if there's a God that you can logically hold that humanity has inherent value. God is the basis for the belief that our culture is built upon. So to, if we take God out of the picture and we take out equality and the uniqueness of humanity, we are no longer special creations of God. We're no longer all created by God. We're simply an evolutionary byproduct like every single other evolutionary byproduct. And there's only a few consistent atheists, right, who, who actually logically get here. So Peter Singer, he's one guy who I respect because of his logical consistency. He believes there's no God, and so he believes that an adult chimpanzee has as much value, has more value than a baby than a baby child. And he, he's not a crackpot. He, he arrives at this conclusion logically by recognizing without God, with simply evolution at play, that it's about what you do for society that gives you worth and value. And that's it. And this is where logical consistency moves towards when, when God's taken out of the question, isn't it? And our culture has begun to move down this slope because we've begun to deny the existence of God from our, what we've been built on. And so an example of that is Harambe. Remember the ape, Harambe, that was shot because to save a child that fell into their cage, into the ape's cage. And the outrage that ensued, how could they kill an ape to save a child? What did the ape ever do? But because there's a God who created humanity unique, means humanity is more value than an animal. And this is the message of Psalm 8. Because of God... You have value. Because of God, you have value. And to see this, we need to follow the psalm. This is what he does. He, he looks at God, he looks at us, and then he looks back at God. And that's what the psalm does. So that's what we will do to understand our value. We first need to look at God. If you ever have asked yourself, am I of value? This is where we need to go first. 
That's what David does as he writes this psalm, considering the central question in the psalm, what is man? And you can imagine him, right? David's sitting out of the field, looking after the sheep. He's probably lying back on the grass, looking up at the stars in the sky. And he says in verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens above the heavens so that the earth and the heavens can't contain your greatness can't contain your brilliance and the the god of israel who david knows the god of israel who created every single thing that we can see every single person that we know the god of israel who rescued them from slavery who no that was after david who who, who gave him a promise that he would have a, a descendant the reign on the throne forever This is the God that he knows, and he knows that this God is extraordinary. Even out of the weakest, littlest mouth who praised this God, David says, that child is more powerful than the assaults mustered by enemy forces. More powerful because of God's greatness. See that in verse 2? That's what he says. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. As one commentary put it, he said, Even nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk, silence atheist babble. And that one great preacher Spurgeon, he said, How often will children tell us of a God whom we've forgotten? And I I experience this when my kids pray at night. Will be at tea time, and when Grace prays, and she's so certain of heaven to come. And when Hunter prays, and he's so sure of God's love for him, and Ruby prays, and she knows without a doubt that she can trust the God of everything. And I'm reminded of the great God that we serve. And even when Jesus was on earth, you may, you may know this, that when Jesus was on earth, he knew this. He performs a miracle in the temple, and the little children, what do they do? The little children shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. And the religious skull kickers of the time, they say to Jesus, you know, do you hear what these guys are saying? Shut them up. They shouldn't be there blaspheming against God. And do you know what Jesus does? He just quotes verse 2 in chapter 8 of the Psalms. Jesus accepts praise addressed to God for himself and the Pharisees, the enemies of God, who are shamed by the children's insight. That God chooses little children to exalt how big he is. That even the words of a little child is powerful because of how majestic God is. Do you know how great God is? That's what verses 1 and 2 are about. Because to know our worth, to know our value, this is where we need to start. And the better we understand God, the better we see his greatness, the better we understand our value this becomes clear as we go through the psalm so let's go to verse 3 when i look at your heavens it's a beautiful verse isn't it? when i look at your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you've set in place uh, david says look up there in the clear middle eastern night sky that he sees the billions of stars and when was the last time that you looked up at the night sky in the open country without other lights and you see the billions of stars in the milky way but we even know more than david don't we that there's not just billions of stars there's billions of galaxies with billions of stars and there's billions upon billions of planets around those billions of stars we know that there's more stars in the night sky than grains of sand on the earth And that God made that. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Look at God. Look at all he's done. Look at his power. Look at his majesty. And see that we are nothing compared to God's greatness. We cannot create light from nothing, let alone trillions of of, uh, gigantic balls of gas up in the heavens. So if you want to feel small, if you want to feel small, look at God. You might be wondering, you know, Matt, you're telling us we're small and insignificant. Is this about how valuable we are? 
and you're right, I am, I am telling you that, but to fully understand our value, we first need to understand how small we are in comparison to God. In comparison to the universe that he created, we are a mere blip. We're so small and helpless and puny. So often we think of ourselves as powerful and in control. We like to imagine we're kings of our universe or at least of our homes. But look around. Look at the galaxies. Look at God and see how insignificant we are in comparison. To understand our value, we first need to look at God. Now listen carefully to this. The bigger our picture of God, the more startling verse 4 strikes us. Because with basalled amazement and perplexed joy, David says in verse 4, What's man that you're mindful of him? And the son of, son of man that you care for him. After meditating on the greatness of God, he looks at us and wonders why would he bother with us? Why even take a second look our way? And at times in your life, I wonder if you've ever felt unnoticed before. I wonder if there's been times when you haven't felt like, you know, no one cares about me. Especially if you're the middle child like I am, maybe you've often felt forgotten. But it's not true though. You've never been forgotten. This great and powerful God, it says, notices you. He cares about you. And this gives you and everybody else on this planet value. It gives us value because the great and powerful God notices us. Even though God is so big and we're so small, still God cares about us and notices us. I have this photo of, at, um, of me at NT. NT was this huge gathering I used to go to once a year, about 2,000 other students. And it's a sea of people in this huge, massive building. And they always got like a top-notch speaker from around the world who would come across. I would love listening to their speaker, these speakers. Had a little, you know, a bit of awe for these speakers. And one time in this sea of people, of 2,000 people, he, he noticed me and he came over and he chatted to me. He even asked me to hold his glasses for him while he got up to speak. And I took a photo of me holding his glasses and I felt special because this guy noticed me out of all these people right and yet he was just another human being on a planet and it was just in a in a group of 2,000 people but in a planet of over 7 billion people not just another human but but God notices us and he just doesn't give us his glasses to hold us and like he he cares about us he notices you. And this gives each of us infinite value because an infinite God notices us. But there's more. God doesn't just notice us, notice as we go through the psalm. He also created us and he created us unique and special. We're not like the rest of the world or the universe. We're not just another animal. So look at verse 5. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. We're more than just another animal. We're a body with, with a soul. We're created by God in his image. And that, it says, is glory and honor. One man, Philip Adams, he, he disagrees. He doesn't see that we've been created this way. We have no glory and honor like that. He would read verse 5 and he would scoff at it. And so he says, like the hippopotamus and the hedgehog, humans are simply an evanescent, means vanishing, expression of the life force as destined for oblivion as dodos and dinosaurs. That's his view of you and I. It's his view of humanity. That's what Philip believes because he doesn't believe there's a God. And if there's no God who notices you, or who created you, then he's right. 
But the psalmist disagrees entirely. In fact, he goes on, not only does God notice us, not only did God create us unique, he also put us in charge. Look at verse 6 to 8. He says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea is God's put us in charge, hasn't he? He's put us in charge of his handcrafted world of birds flying, fish swimming, and whales singing in the ocean deeps. There's just one problem with this picture in Psalm 8. There's just one big problem. The crown on our heads is too heavy. C.S. Lewis, a great guy, uh, he, he watched Elizabeth II's coronation all that long time ago. And he thought it reflected a lot of what Psalm 8 is telling us. He says, the pressing of that huge, heavy crown on that small, young head of Elizabeth II becomes a sort of symbol for the situation of humanity itself. One feels that we have all been crowned, and that coronation is somehow, if splendid, a tragic splendor in many ways we're a glorious ruin part glory part ruin because when we look around we actually like just look at the news and we see our ruling hasn't gone as well as it should have we see the hatred the distraction the wars the violence the selfishness the greed and we should wonder what sort of royal failure we've been? Our value must mean little now. And we can't even control everything. We can't control tsunamis. We can't control the sound of, the sound of cockatoos outside that distracts us all. We, can't, we don't have control or power over everything that we're supposed to rule over. And when we say in one moment, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, and the next we yell at our loved ones rule the world we can't even rule the words that come out of our mouths and destroy relationships we can't even rule our own hearts there's still inherent equal value in humanity but something isn't right it's not as psalm 8 presents it there's a there's a massive problem isn't there we not only fail at controlling this world the world would be given to take care of but we, but we also suffer death don't we it's not the way it's meant to be. And so our value is tainted by our failures. We're not all we are created to be. And that's why when Bert read Hebrews for us, Hebrews chapter 2, the author recognizes this problem, doesn't he? He, know, he reads Psalm 8 and he quotes Psalm 8 and he says, we've got this problem. But he says, there's a solution to this problem. And he says, the answer is, is Jesus to this psalm. The answer is Jesus to this problem. Because for a little while, Jesus, the God-man, made himself lower than the angels. He became human, it says. And as a human, he's crowned with all glory and honor because he suffered. And so he tastes death for everyone. So that he can restore us to what we were created to be. So that Jesus restores our value by his suffering. The God man shows our ultimate value because the great and powerful God not only notices us, not only created us, not only put us in charge, but when we mucked up royally, he restores us. He suffers for us. He redeems us. And so we have value because of God, not because of ourselves. We have value because of God, not because of ourselves. So that we can only finish with this psalm and cry out like he does, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And this is how you know you have value. 
It makes me think of the old Spice ad. Do you remember the old Spice ad? Where um, that, you know, that guy who's supposed to be the ultimate specimen of a man. And, and he says, uh, look at your man. Now look at me. Now back at your man. Now back at me. Sadly, he isn't me. And, uh, you know, he's trying to sell the old spice to, to, for us guys because he's the ultimate specimen. So people want to be like him because compared to him, everyone else is nothing. And that's sort of how this psalm goes. Look at God. Look at us. Look at God. But this psalm not only shows the greatness of God in comparison, it also does it to reveal the van- value that you have. That even though we're nothing in comparison, God makes us everything because He notices, He creates, and He restores us. And this means, this means that if you don't, if you're here sitting here and hearing all this, and you don't believe that there's a God, and if you don't trust in the saving work of Christ that restores us, then there's no such thing as inherent or equal value in humanity. The foundational beliefs that our, our culture's built on crumbles beneath us. We, we need to stop building on the foundation of Christianity. Either we accept the truth of God, or we need to stop pretending, and this, this is a rough sentence, we need to stop pretending that there's anything significant about your life. If there's no God, stop pretending there's anything significant about your life. In the end, we have to agree with Singer and Philip Adams, who say that there's no purpose or plan for each individual of human, humanity. There's nothing special about us. So if you don't believe there's a God, stop pretending there is. Because the only value we have is if there's a great and mighty and powerful God who notices, creates, and redeems us, then you have value. So look to God to find your value. Run to Jesus who restores your value. And cry out with David, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And for many of us here, for many of us here, you've already accepted there's a God who gives you value. You may have thought about this before, and you trust in Jesus for your salvation already. And, and, and what you need to do then is stop following the lies that surround us in our culture. Because there's so many lies that tell us where our value actually comes from. But they're wrong. Stop believing your value is tied to what you do. That doesn't give you value. Except everyone in society thinks that's what gives us value. That's why whenever you meet someone, you ask, what do you do? Because that's the thing that defines them. That's the thing that gives them worth and value. And so you think you know them by what they do. But that is not what gives us value. Some people here might, might think that you don't have much value. You might have a low opinion of yourself. Well, remember this. You are valuable because God values you. It's not based on your performance at work. It's not based on a family who may or may not love you. It's not based on friends that you may or may not have at school. You are valued because God values you. You're not worthless. So that the youngest or the oldest or the weakest or the sickliest or the unloved or the unliked, you are just as valuable as any other person because God values you, because He notices, creates, and redeems you. Now, for others of us here, we might have a high opinion of ourselves instead of a low one you know life seems to be going well and you seem to like you have a lot of it all sorted out you often don't think of yourself as worthless you think of yourself as quite valuable remember this 
God doesn't value us because we've got it all together. God doesn't value us because we're charming or charismatic. God doesn't value us because we're highly thought of by our friends and work colleagues. God doesn't value us because we do lots at church, because we're always welcoming to visitors, because we serve on the rosters, because we go to discipleship groups and Bible study groups every week. God doesn't value us because we open up the Bible and read it every day. No, we're small and insignificant. God never needs us. The reason we have value is not based on us, but based on God's gracious mercy to us. This means, this means that any feeling of superiority, the temptation to ever look down on someone else at BPC, is always wrong. And it's easy to do, isn't it? I think humanity is hardwired to look at others and, and just look down your nose. It's easy to look at the next person and always find the person you look down at. It's like, you know, that feeling. Someone told me this once and it resonated with me so much. You know, when your lawns are really high and sort of out of control at, at your place and then you, you mow your lawns and they all look nice and neat and then you go for a walk in your neighborhood and you see someone else's lawns that are a little overgrown. You think, oh, what are they doing there? You know, it's so easy to look down your nose at other people and it's so easy to do that with other Christians as well. You know, because, because we contribute more or to think that God must be more pleased with me than with that person. But our value only comes from God. So that... The socially awkward, the one with mental health issues, the one who doesn't serve a church, the one who more obviously struggles with sin, the one who isn't as theologically accurate as you are, the one who doesn't open their Bibles as often. Each person here at BBC is deeply valued by God. And so then how could we not also value each other? So am I of value? Look at God and see that he gives you value. And every single other person value. And so know not only your value, but the value of others as well. Let's pray that we would be able to know this.